In the previous video, I replaced the upstream oxygen sensor in my car. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but the oxygen sensor was actually working just fine. So I replaced the perfectly good part, which now leaves me with a working but used oxygen sensor that I can use in this video. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at this oxygen sensor, seeing how it works, and trying to analyze a bit of a mystery that comes with it. Let's get started. Scanner, tech, tenor, tech, tenor, tenor, tech, tenor, tech, tenor. Hello, this is Danner Tech. Now, first of all, it's important to understand how O2 sensors work. There's two main types of O2 sensors. There's the narrow band and the wide band. What you're looking at here is a narrow band O2 sensor, and its workings are pretty simple. So you have something called a nursed cell, and that is made of zirconium dioxide, as well as some titanium that is on one side. And basically what happens is it generates a voltage potential based off the difference in concentrations of oxygen on both sides. So if there's more air in the exhaust, then oxygen will diffuse over through the nursed cell, but less oxygen will diffuse, so it will create a lesser voltage potential. Whereas on this side, if the exhaust gas is rich and there is less oxygen inside it, then more oxygen will diffuse through the nursed cell into the oxygen gas, and it will generate a higher voltage potential. Narrowband oxygen sensors are very good, but they are by no means perfect. This is a graph of the output of a narrowband oxygen sensor, with the sensor output in volts on the y-axis and the air-fuel ratio on the x-axis. Now the problem with this is the car doesn't know the exact air-fuel ratio of the exhaust. It just knows if it's too high or too low. That's where the wideband oxygen sensor comes in. So how this wideband oxygen sensor works this is going to have this nursed cell, which measures a voltage potential depending on the oxygen concentration between the reference air and the exhaust air that is going into this small test chamber. And then we also have a pump cell, which can pump oxygen ions either into this test chamber or back out into the exhaust stream. And so what's going to happen here is your exhaust gas comes in, and if it's at the exact air-fuel ratio, the voltage potential here is going to be 0.45 volts. And so with a feedback circuit, it will not supply any current across this pump cell. But if the air going into this test chamber is a little bit rich, it's going to start putting a current through here because the voltage is going to change. If it's rich, the voltage is going to go up, and so it's going to compensate by putting a small current around here. And so the pump cell is going to pump oxygen ions into the test chamber until this voltage again returns to 0.45 volts. And as there's air constantly flowing into this test chamber, there will constantly be ions pumping across this pump cell. And we'll be able to measure that by reading the current supplied into this pump cell. And so this is very interesting. If the oxygen coming in here is too lean, then it's going to pump oxygen ions out. And we'll see that current flow through the cell again, but in reverse. This method of measuring oxygen inside exhaust fumes is a lot more efficient than using the narrowband oxygen sensor because it's a lot more linear. You can see that we can more accurately map what that air-fuel ratio is, which helps the car correct for it better and be more efficient. Now oxygen sensors, no matter what type they are, narrowband or wideband, need to be heated. A wideband oxygen sensor needs to be heated to around 600 degrees Celsius, and a narrowband oxygen sensor needs to be heated to around 400 degrees Celsius which takes a lot of current. So there's a little heater inside here that connects to two of the wires that heats the little element in there to red hot. Now here's where I got a little bit confused. In a typical wideband oxygen sensor, you have five wires. Two go to the heater, one goes to one end of the nursed cell, one wire goes to the other end of the pump cell, and one wire goes to both the other end of the nursed cell and the other end of the pump cell. And those wires are typically connected to ground for this thing to function. So I was curious, perhaps, if maybe the casing of this oxygen sensor was the ground. Now to test this theory, I went to the data sheet for this particular oxygen sensor, which wasn't too helpful except for this bit of information. This states that the blue wire is sensor plus, the white wire is sensor minus, and both black wires are the heater wires. And then on a four wire oxygen sensor, we have the heater wire, the ground, the sensor wire, and the sensor ground. And you can see on the four wire, there's nothing saying that the sensor casing is electrically connected to anything in the circuit of the sensor. 
Now, if this is true, I should be able to connect this sensor with heater wires and get it all warmed up. And then I should be able to measure the voltage between each of these sensor wires and the casing ground and not see any voltage. And that will confirm that the sensor casing is not acting as a ground, because otherwise we'll see that 0.45 volts of the nursed cell. As you can see here, I have one wire connected to one of the sensor wires, nothing. Connecting it to the other sensor wire, nothing. No voltage, and this thing is fully heated up. So now we know for sure the sensor casing is not electrically connected to anything in this circuit. So after some digging online, I was able to find two obscure PDF documents that somewhat explain how these sensors are able to function with only two wires and no casing. So basically what happens is you apply a positive 3 volts to one wire and a positive 3.3 volts to another wire, and by measuring the current that flows through the circuit, you can measure the oxygen to fuel ratio in the exhaust, or the oxygen differential between the exhaust gases and the normal atmospheric gases. Now this explanation makes sense considering the sensor I'm dealing with only has four wires, two heater wires, and two sensor wires, but it is still a little bit confusing how this works and doesn't necessarily make sense with my knowledge of how narrowband and wideband oxygen sensors work. If you have another explanation for this diagram, uh, please let me know in the comments, or if you have another diagram that maybe explains it better, please let me know as well. So this part of the schematic is still a little bit confusing. I think there's more to it, like more components in here besides just these two electrodes that it shows, or perhaps some circuitry inside here. Although circuitry doesn't really survive well in the conditions where an oxygen sensor is located at. But the part that makes more sense to me is their electronic diagram here, which still doesn't make sense. I mean, come on, they labeled this a PID driver when it's definitely just another op amp, and this resistor, like, nothing else is labeled in here. They didn't even put inverting and non-inverting inputs. And why is this resistor 2.7K? This would never work in this circuit at all, because this side needs to be kept at 3.3 volts by the circuit, and this sensor is going to have, like, 2 milliamps flowing through it, 3 milliamps at most, and with 2 milliamps flowing through this resistor, we're gonna get a voltage drop of 5.4 volts. And so this point of the circuit would need to be around 8.7 volts. So that's definitely not the swing between four and two volts. And why do they have an amp meter here? You're supposed to be measuring the voltage output at this point. That's the whole point of the circuit. And then also they're supplying this so-called PID driver, which is really just an off amp with five volts. So there's no way it could produce 8.7 volts. So this circuit is just dumb. So here is a slightly better circuit that only uses one op amp and a properly sized resistor. We also have the inverting and non-inverting inputs labeled properly. So we have 3.3 volts on the non-inverting input and this op amp is going to try to keep this point at exactly 3.3 volts as well. And the voltage here will change depending on how much current the sensor is drawing. So for instance, let's say it's drawing two milliamps. That means the voltage drop across this resistor is approximately two volts which means that this side is going to be 5.3 volts. So this op amp is going to be outputting 5.3 volts. Now first, before we build that other circuit, we're going to see how much current this draws when this sensor has an exact 0.3 volt drop across it. So for that, we're going to build this regulator circuit that will supply a precise voltage of 0.3 volts. So here, this is an LM317 voltage regulator, and this voltage regulator works by trying to keep this point at exactly 1.2 volts. And so by changing these resistors, you can change the output voltage. That output voltage will stay the same regardless of the input voltage. So this output voltage, I think, outputs to around 3 volts. And then dividing that by 10 in this voltage divider, we're going to get 0.3 volts. And that's going to go through an op-amp buffer. So we get a 0.3 volts that will not change depending on how much current is drawn by the circuit. Then we can hook up a multimeter in between these two to measure the current that is flowing. Here's the test power supply circuit. I have about 8 volts coming in. I have the LM317, a potentiometer, voltage divider, capacitors, and this op amp that acts as a buffer. The 0.3 volt wire is connected to the blue wire, and the white wire is connected through this multimeter to ground. 
I have my O2 sensor sitting in this chili sauce can with this big hole cut in the side and a small hole cut in the top for the O2 sensor to sit in. As you can see, the multimeter registers that it's drawing 2.63 milliamps right now. This is a very lean mixture because there's just normal air inside here. Let's change that up. Here I'll add a little bit of map gas, no fire, but this map gas should make the mixture inside here more rich with less oxygen. So we should see this current draw change a little bit. Oh wow, that was fast. It's dropping 2.41, 2.39. Dropped all the way down to 2.36. That's crazy. Now, let's see if that will go back to normal once I blow all the map gas out of this chamber. Well, that is good news. It looks like the sensor is working. We're able to read the current output. Now it's back to what it was before we added the map gas. All right, now I'm gonna to try to build that other circuit I was showing you earlier to see if we can get a varying voltage output according to the current that this thing is drawing. All right, I have the circuit and it's working great. So this is what I built here. I have my 3.3 volts supplied with the LM317 regulator and then I have a voltage divider that's a fine-tuned potentiometer that's supplying three volts from that 3.3 volt output. That three volts then goes to an op-amp buffer so that way it doesn't change when current changes. And I have this all built. So we see here right now the multimeter is reading 5.79 volts. That is this point right here. I have an unknown potentiometer connected or the sensor will be connected. And as you can see here we can verify the voltages here are really 3.3 and 3 volts. See that one is 3 volts exactly. That one is 3.31 so close enough. And this one will be 5.78. I guess 5, yeah, 5.79. So let's do some calculations here to find out what this potentiometer might be at. Okay, that means that it's drawing 2.4 milliamps. So that means that resistor should be approximately 120 ohms. They're the potentiometer right now. Let's verify that that's true. Wow, that was spot on. All right, here's the moment of truth. Sensor's all hooked up. We should hopefully see voltage out here. 3.31 volts. Interesting. So this is strange. There's 4.7 millivolts across that resistor. And at the test point, it's still at 3.3 volts, which goes to show that this circuit isn't drawing any current, which isn't right. It should be drawing current, we know that it draws current when the multimeter is hooked up in series with it, and we know that it draws current when there is 0.3 volts across its two leads. I have this meter now in series with the leads of this one to measure the current draw of this probe. Back here, I have the voltage measuring the voltage output of the current sense circuit. We see that this is climbing. I think it just needs to stabilize. I'm not sure why it the current there is kind of unstable. But anyway, if I put map gas on here, you can see that this current draw changes like it should. But over here, this reader is still reading 3.37 volts. Nothing changed. Well, I replaced it with a new op amp. I had different to IP too, and it still doesn't work. We're still getting that 3.33 volts on the test out point, which shouldn't be, should still be something like five, um, especially with 2.6 milliamps flowing through the sensor circuit. So there's definitely something else afoot here. Interesting. So I just connected my potentiometer again, and it's drawing 3.0 milliamps as expected. But over here, my readout for the volts on the output is still 3.3. Okay, so the plot thickens. I hooked up my board again, instead using the uh, potentiometer there. It's like 120 ohms. Uh, I kind of adjusted it a little bit, so it's probably not exactly that anymore. And instead of having my Radio Shack multimeter in series, I have this analog multimeter. 
So right now it's reading about 2 milliamps on the output. Over there, that multimeter is reading 5 volts on the test point. So this circuit's performing as it should. It is supplying current and monitoring that current by showing us an output voltage. Everything's good, right? Wrong. As soon as I reconnect the oxygen sensor, all the current goes back down to zero. The analog meter is reading nothing, and that meter is reading 3.3 .3 volts, which also means nothing is going on. No current is flowing. But we know there is current flowing, because when I plug in my Radio Shack meter, we can see current. Now it's connected with the sensor in place. The Radio Shack meter reads 2.6 milliamps, like it should. My voltmeter back there is still reading 3.3 volts. So this shows there's no current. And when I had the analog meter in series, it showed there was no current with the sensor. Yet we know there's current. The Radio Shack meter shows there is. Better yet, it's not only showing that there's current, but it's showing that the sensor is working. Because when I put map gas on the sensor, it changes. To further add to the mystery, if I add my potentiometer back into the circuit instead of the sensor, you can see that it's drawing 3 milliamps, which is correct. But down here, this meter is still reading 3.34 volts, as if there's no current flowing. Now if I short out the Radio Shack meter, something weird happens. The Radio Shack meter stops reading things, and my current measuring circuit starts functioning again. So what's happening here? This is kind of an updated circuit diagram of what's happening. Here I have the power supply supplying the 3.3 and 3 volts. This side works perfectly. This side is where things are getting sort of problematic. So here I have this test point. This test point is the output of this operational amplifier. And here we have the sensor, which we can replace with a 120 ohm resistor in the form of a potentiometer. And here is the current meter, which I tried with no current meter, this is short here, a uh, Radio Shack current meter, and a analog current meter. Now the conclusion that I've come to with this strange information is that you can only properly measure the current from the O2 sensor if you have the Radio Shack multimeter. That is the only device that will properly measure the current. The test point will not measure the current, an analog meter will not measure the current, and then for testing any kind of current, if you have the Radio Shack meter in series with it, then the test point data won't be right either. So the results that I have come to are that the oxygen sensor draws current in a strange way that I'm not familiar with yet, and the Radio Shack multimeter draws current in a different way that I'm not yet familiar with. That is a very strange problem and I still haven't quite figured out how to make it work. So I guess in the meantime, I'll just be using the Radio Shack multimeter to measure the current draw of the O2 sensor to measure the oxygen content. And that'll be for now. I'm gonna keep working on this, and I'll update the description if I find anything out. So if you have any ideas, or any way to explain the strange results I was receiving today, please leave a comment. I'd love to read that and hear different ideas. But for now, thank you for watching, and have a great day.